tonight, appeal court in Abuja mandates status quo ante with respect to all matters concerning value-added tax collection. President Mohamed Buhari appeals to striking health workers to embrace negotiations as a means of ending strikes in the sector. Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo seeks elite commitment to greater responsibility for peace and development. And United Nations condemns Taliban crackdown on protesters. Plus international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, Nigeria's crude production capacity reportedly dipped to 1.23 million barrels per day in August, its lowest level this year. On sports news tonight, unseeded teenagers Emma Raducanu and Leila Fernandez advanced to U.S. Open Women's Singles Final. And from the nation's capital, former President Goodluck Jonathan says existential threats to national unity must be met with words and action designed for peace. Maintain status quo. That is the order from the Court of Appeal in Abuja asking parties in the value-added tax dispute with the FIRS to refrain from taking action that would give effect to the judgment of the Federal High Court in favour of River State in the VAT dispute. This follows the Lagos State Government's application to be joined as a co-respondent in the civil motion filed by the Federal Inland Revenue Service which is asking for a stay of execution of a Federal High Court judgment, which had declared that the River State Government has a right to collect value-added tax and personal income tax in the state. The legal fireworks over the collection of value-added tax births at the Court of Appeals as the Federal Inland Revenue Service, FIRS, files for a stay of execution of the judgment of the Federal High Court, Port Harcourt, the River State Capital. First, the Lagos State Government files an application to be joined as a correspondent in the appeal. The Lagos State Attorney General told the court that it was in the best interest of justice and fair hearing that the state be made a party in the suit. In its ruling, a three-man panel led by Justice Haruna Samani specifically ordered all the parties in the suit to refrain from taking any action to give effect to the judgment of the lower court. The Federal High Court in Port Harcourt had given some far-reaching judgments. Now we have approached this court to say stop the effect of that judgment until you hear our appeal. Unfortunately, we could not argue that today. Now the issue is this, should, because our application has not been heard, should the court allow River State to start collecting tax even though we are telling this court to say hold on? until we are heard. So the court is now saying, well, we have not heard them. Until we hear them, no decision can be taken one way or other. But everybody should hands off. Hold on. Don't affect the, don't take, uh, affect the judgment of the Federal High Court until after we have heard them. If we agree with them, fine. If we don't agree with them, then you can go ahead. So it will last until we move our application for injunction. So that's just the position. The case has been adjourned to September the 16th, 2021, for hearing of all pending applications, including the request by the Lagos State Government to be joined in the matter. Meanwhile, the Lagos State Governor, Babajide Songwulu, has signed into law the state's value-added tax bill after it was passed by the State House of Assembly yesterday. According to a statement signed by the Commissioner for Information and Strategy, Mr. Bengao Motosho, the governor signed the bill for a law to impose and charge VAT on certain goods and services. By this act, the bill has now become a law. The governor signed the bill after returning from an official trip to Abuja. Well, the River State Governor Yesenwike is not backing down as he charges members of the state's tax appeal commission to enshrine a new culture in which taxable persons and entities will comply with the relevant tax laws in the state without hesitation. 
Governor Wike gave the charge after swearing in the River State Body of Tax Appeal Commissioners at the Government House, Pultar Court. <laughs> No country can survive without taxes. No country. And so you do all you can to support the, the government and the citizens to do what they're supposed to do. I have confidence, at least I know the chairman, I have confidence in you that you'll be able to lead their colleagues, their members, to do the right thing. So once again, let me congratulate you and believe that you have to kickstart immediately. And that I told you I will be coming back today and then you will liaise with you and then you get an appropriate office where you will operate from. Into other stories, President Muhammad Buhari has asked striking health workers to opt for negotiation no matter how long it takes as a means of settling issues rather than embark on an industrial action which is not the best action to take. The President made the declaration today when he received members of the Nigerian Medical Association at the State House underpinning the danger of a protracted strike and withdrawal of services which could potentially result in the loss of lives. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mizuke, reports. In a step that may be considered as a point of concern, President Muhammadu Buhari meets the leadership of the Nigerian Medical Association at the State House in the face of the industrial action by the National Association of Resident Doctors. The President looks at the issues through the lens of negotiation. I use this opportunity to call on all health workers Turn to their duty posts, and I ask others contemplating strikes to opt for amicable settlement of issues by negotiations, no matter how long it takes. The lives of citizens that could be lost or damaged when doctors withdraw services are precious enough to justify a peaceful resolution of differences. He is aware that the nation's health sector has not been the same. The president, who has full understanding of the 12 points demands by the workers, underpins that all debts owed will be settled. I request that the agreement reached in the meetings on the 20th and 21st August is captured in the MOU, which I have seen be rigorously implemented. This administration has a good track record of paying all debts owed to government workers, pensioners, and the contractors. And we have even revisited debts left by past administrations once due verifications is done. Increase in budgetary allocation in the nation's health sector is among other efforts by the federal government the NMA is appreciative about. Your keen interest in immunization and improvement of immunization coverage in the country and overall turnaround of some of the nation's health facilities, the seven uh, one million life project, the empowerment of different health agencies and parastatas are worthy of mention. <laughs> The 40-day-old industrial action by the National Association of Resident Doctors has received several interventions and pleas by the National Assembly. The President's request is expected to set the tone for a speedy resolution to the matter and potentially an end to further disruptions in the nation's healthcare system. Gloria Umizuki, Channel Television News. And staying with the president, his recent visits to Imo State is one that will be spoken about for a long time yet, going by the interactive session held with members of the region. At the meeting, matters of secession, infrastructure, unity and elections were brought up and addressed by him. There are many things to take away from President Mohamedou Buhari's visit to Imo State. But beyond the inspection and commissioning, what may be a particular interest to the people of the Eastern Region is this interactive session to air out pent-up concerns. 
Before presenting the first case, the governor of Imo State appreciates the president's attention to the security crisis that briefly rocked some states in the east, then calls for understanding of what the request of the region is all about, which are acceptance, tolerance, and unity. We are everywhere making our contributions to the economic advancement of Nigeria. With our investments and social attachment to our host communities, it is really inconceivable to imagine that we should support the breakup of Nigeria, not now, not tomorrow, never. The misperception of the Igbos, as the President General of Oanese Indigbo puts it, is what has brought about the notion that the region is all about secession and sets about to change the narrative. Believe it or not, Igbos are market people and travel adventurers. Consequently, what defines the character of Igbos is propensity for friendliness a harmonious, peaceful coexistence. And this is coupled with a spirit of universalism of mankind. President Buhari praises the people of the region for not only being present in virtually all communities in the country, but being active as well. He wonders why with all that economic influence, anyone would dream of leaving. There is no town you will visit in Nigeria without the Igbos being in charge of either the infrastructure or pharmaceutical from even galvanizers. So for any Igbo men in anywhere to think that of uh, anything outside Nigeria is unthinkable for me. The president also touches on issues surrounding infrastructure, security, and elections. We are going to do the roads, we are going to do the rent, and we are going to stabilize power. We will try and secure the country so that Nigerians can mind their own businesses. If there is no security, there is nothing anybody can do, no matter how much he tries or how much initiative he has. But I try to make sure elections are free and fair. Make sure you honestly and practically educate your constituency and you ask for their votes. A memorable day ends with presentations of recognition to the president, hopefully signaling the beginning of unity in the nation. In part two after the break, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo seeks elite commitment to greater responsibility for peace and development. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Appeal Court in Abuja mandates status quo ante with respect to all matters concerning value-added tax collection. President Muhammadu Buhari appeals to striking health workers to embrace negotiations as a means of ending strikes in the sector. Vice President Yemi Oshibajo seeks elite commitment to greater responsibility for peace and development. And United Nations condemns Taliban crackdown on protesters. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, is urging Nigeria's elite to do better and not add to the weakness in the Nigerian society, offering consensus building and mediating elite conflict and competition as a solution. He was speaking at the Leadership Newspapers Conference and Award Night, which held in Abuja. The Vice President states that the country is facing challenges to the national order, driven by a sense of exclusion and marginalization, especially with the division between the haves and the have-nots in the society. 
The external reasons that we frequently cite for our problems, those reasons that we frequently give for the problems of African states, and in particular Nigeria, cannot thrive without severe internal weaknesses in our society. And I venture to say that the chief weakness, the chief weakness that we have is a human one. Our elite, our political, economic, and religious elite, an elite that has so far proved to be socially irresponsible. That is, one which either by selfishness negligence or ignorance or a lack of self-awareness has so far been unable to build the institutions and more importantly the social and political consensus upon which a just and orderly society can start. And because dominance must be premised on some form of consensus, the elite depend on a dubious one, the promotion of tribal and religious false lines for legitimacy. So the attacks we see on law and order are themselves symptomatic and they are driven by emergent critiques of the fabric of order itself. These critiques are manifesting as insurrections and insurgencies along various axes of identity. We must be able to say to the young men and women who, for example, say that secession is the only way or that we should break into little nations and that that is the only way we must be able to say to them that that is the way of extinction, not development. The live ammunition presented by the Nigerian army is of the same caliber as the cartridge casing submitted by the Lagos Judicial Panel of Inquiry into Police Brutality. That's the testimony from Sentinel Forensic Limited, which has engaged by the Lagos State Government in December 2020 to conduct a forensic review into the incident at the Lekki Toll Gate on October 20, 2020. The forensic report also says that the authenticity of the video evidence tendered by the Lekki Concession Company could not be determined owing to a lack of access to its servers, but extensive visual examination shows that as to the frame, the time frame and pixel, the videos do not show any signs of being doctored. All these came to the fore at today's sitting of the panel inquiry set up to investigate the claims of police brutality by the Lagos State Government. Our judiciary correspondent, Shola Shirele, reports. It's admitted and marked as be big. It's the 122nd sitting of the Lagos Judicial Panel on restitution for victims of SARS-related abuses and other matters. And the focus at these proceedings is the long-awaited forensic report from the Lekki Tollgate shooting of October 20, 2020. On the 29th of December 2020, the Lagos State Government had engaged Sentinel Forensic Limited, a private company, to conduct a crime scene investigation, examine the Lekki Concession Company's CCTV footage, and give digital expert opinion on the recording of the incidents, as well as any evidence recovered during the visit of the panel to the scene. A director of the forensic company, Joseph Funshuaku, compared the evidence submitted, and this is the findings as to the ballistics. The Nigerian Army submitted four ammunition. Two of them were 762 by 39 millimeter caliber, and that was the, the live one and the live that hadn't been fired. And two of them were 762 by 51 millimeter caliber. They are, they are both different. You have 7.62 by 39 millimeter ammunition. One fired, and this was of the live kind of ammunition. And one was a live ammunition that was not fired. Then you have blank rounds that were tendered. One of those blanks was fired, and one of those blanks was not fired. And the blanks that were tendered were 7.62 by 51 millimeter, which is quite different from 
762 by PS. The summary really is that the blank ammunition submitted by the Nigerian Army uh, is not designed to be fired by the rifles that fired the light rounds. On the video evidence submitted by the Lekki Concession Company and the investigation of the crime scene, the forensic expert gave this analysis. For the digital uh, evidence, um, the authenticity of the video evidence tendered by LCC could not be determined as we have no access to the servers from which the source recording was made. Uh, however, during extensive visual examination of the captured footage, uh, because we reviewed the footage frame by frame, uh, the evidence that the footage given to us did not show any signs of being doctored. So the time frame and the pixel were consistent, suggesting that the integrity of so the integrity. The panel has adjourned till Saturday, September 11, to give lawyers in the matter an opportunity to study the forensic report so that they can cross-examine the expert witness on his findings. Shola Shreeli, Channels Television News. And from the panel hearing, we're back in River State, where a high court in Port Harcourt has affirmed the suspension of Mr. Uche Secondus as a member of the People's Democratic Party by his ward executives. The judge, Justice Okobule Gassam, affirmed this in a judgment delivered on the originating summons filed by some members of the PDP in River State, seeking the interpretation of the constitution of the party, whether Mr. Secundus is entitled to enjoy the rights and privileges of a national chairman of the PDP, having been suspended by the executives of his party in Ward 5, Ikuru Town in Andoni local government area, who accused him of involvement in anti-party activities. The claimants also saw clarification of the court on the right of Mr. Secundus to contest elections into any of the party positions or recontest as the national chairman of the party following his suspension. The prayers were, however, contested by Uche Secundus during proceedings through his lawyer, Jeffrey Walaka. But in his judgment, Justice Bassam ruled that the affidavits filed by Mr. Walaka only argues that Uche Secundus can solely be suspended from his position as national chairman by the National Executive Committee, and such is not substantial enough to save the embattled chairman because the crux of the litigation is the suspension of Mr. Secundus from the party and not as national chairman. And almost a week after the Kaduna State Independent Electoral Commission conducted elections in 19 out of the 23 local government areas in the state, the commission says it has declared the exercise in four local government areas inconclusive. The affected councils are Jaba, Jema, Kachia and Soba. The chairman of the commission, Saratu Diko Aoudou, who made the announcement, said the decision was made because elections could not be held in some wards. We are aware that there are elections yet to come in four local governments, Binyangwari, uh, Chukum, Kajun, and Zawo These ones have been scheduled for the 25th of September, and uh, we are working towards that. As for the awards, where we do not have results, we are also looking at the possibility of going back to conduct the when the news at 10 returns, former President Goodluck Jonathan wants leaders to match words with action in ensuring national peace. Please join us again. But from our Buja studios, here's Terry Kumi. Hi, Terry. Hello, Millicent. Former President Goodluck Jonathan is asking Nigeria's political elites to show commitment to peace in words and in action, insisting that the pursuit of peace in Nigeria cannot be achieved without paying adequate attention to justice and equity. 
The former president stated this in Abuja at a public presentation of a research report on terrorism and banditry by the Good Luck Jonathan Foundation. Former President Goodluck Jonathan and the National Security Advisor, General Babagana Monguno, are among the dignitaries attending this public presentation of a research on national security. Thank you, sir. The former president asks politicians to show commitment to solving the country's security problems. There is no doubt that our nation is plagued by many crises, and these challenges have continued to threaten our fate and shared destinies. The crisis facing us today requires sacrifice and urgency of actions from all stakeholders. We must therefore show commitment to peace in which, in words, in action, and in all other necessary means. Terrorism, banditry, and other forms of criminality constitute a major threat to Nigeria's corporate existence and development, a situation the report says is compounded by the country's porous borders. Supporting border management bodies in Nigeria, Niger Republic, Benin Republic, Chad, Cameroon, they are very key to what we do in terms of how we can also strengthen, forge partnership with, partnership with this country and strengthen relations around border security management and control. And lastly, is the whole question of reviewing the ECOWAS protocol on trans transhumans. In his remarks, the National Security Advisor underpins the importance of actionable intelligence in order to effectively combat all security threats. Nigeria is very, very rich you know, in intelligence but poor in information. To convert it to actionable information is what we need to do and we can never achieve any success without working together with the local community and therefore our approach must be such that we view everything from one you know, uh, point of view. Insecurity is a major challenge that the federal government continues to grapple with and many here hope that the report presented will help to find lasting solutions to the problem. The police command of the Federal Capital Territory has arrested a notorious kidnap gang and recovered two AK-47 rifles and 60 rounds of live ammunition. Parading the suspect in Abuja, the FCT Commissioner of Police, Mr. Sunday Babaji, says the six members of the gang are responsible for the kidnappings in the quali axis of the nation's capital. Mr. Babaji also reiterates the ban on the use of unauthorized covered number plates and tainted vehicles. The command has continued to improve upon its community policy strategies by regularly engaging the community to provide actionable intelligence for proactive policing within the federal capital territory. It is worthy of note that one of the high points of the command's recent achievements was the cracking of a notorious kidnapping syndicate where positive arrests were made and arms and ammunitions were recovered. I want to use this medium to appeal to residents to be more security conscious and provide timely information in case of emergency as our phone lines are in circulation. At this juncture, I want to sound a note of warning to criminal elements within the FCT to desist from their criminal activities or face the full rapt of the law. Also, I wish to reinstate the ban on tinted vehicles and covered number plates within the FCT as all violators will be arrested and prosecuted accordingly. I want to use this medium to guarantee residents of the command's resolves commitment towards the protection of lives and property within the federal capital territory. The governments of Yobe and Borono State have been asked to sustain the gains achieved by the Addressing Education in the Northeast program, an initiative of the United States Embassy. According to the director of the U.S. Agency for International Development, Mrs. Ann Patterson, the program aims to get children in crisis-prone regions back to school, with 21,000 already taken off the streets in both states. Our correspondent Kayla Megua has more. Insecurity has left at least 1.8 million children out of school in Borno State and 400,000 out of school in Yobe State. 
Earlier this year, the Ministry of Education stated that more than 1,500 primary and secondary schools in Borno, Adamoa, and Yobe states had been destroyed, and over 2,200 teachers have been killed by the Boko Haram insurgents since 2014. The situation gave birth to the Addressing Education in the Northeast program in 2018. AENN trained more than 2,000 learning facilitators in early grade reading to address the gap created when more than 2,000 teachers had to flee their jobs or were killed in the Northeast. The training also included 600 school administrators who can now train more teachers to maintain the quality of instruction at more than 900 non-formal learning centers established under this program. 13 implementing partners were assigned the job of establishing and managing non-formal learning centers with a purse of between 41 to 52 million naira each. They claim literacy increased by 27 percent in the first year. The states are reminded that these are just interventions. This is only an intervention, an intervention. An intervention does not mean something permanent. Rather, an intervention is showing to us the best practices for us to adopt and achieve what we want. The states promise that these achievements will not be abandoned. We promise to be actively part of the joint planning, implementation assess and assessment to ensure institutional sustainability to such excellent initiatives like AENN. Millions have been pumped into this program and 21,000 children have been taken off the streets and mainstreamed back into regular schooling. The question is, what happens next? After this program ends, as it has ended today, what happens to these children? Will the states be able to continue this momentum? Will this model be replicated in other parts of the country where we have a lot of out-of-school children? Only time will tell. Kayla Megua, Channel Television News. Now, in an attempt to ensure that Offa Community in Kwara State joins the League of Economically Buoyant Communities, it has commenced the move to establish a smart city in line with the information and communication technology revolution of the 21st century. This is with the birth of Offa, an environment innova innovation hub to change the narrative of the community technological-wise and rely less on government employment by the youths. Offa community in Kwara South Senatorial District of Kwara State is known for its self-help projects in the provision of social amenities. The latest is the multi-sectorial industrial park set up with an ICT innovation hub to cater to entrepreneurs engaged in diverse production areas. To commission the project, traditional rulers, union leaders and residents gather to celebrate the feat as they believe it is one that would transform the area to a center for technological growth and commercial advancement. The one innovation hub that we are launching today is the first section of the multi-sectorial industrial park that will be equipped with five production zones to cater for engine uh, entrepreneurs who will be engaged in the processing of agricultural products, solid minerals, production of polymer-based products, and creative industry ventures. This facility will trigger the innovative capacity and creative capacity of our people. You know, this is like a launch site where our people can explore the world. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we, we are grateful to God in Offa. God Offa is the, the place where God definitely is. And I know that we... It's not our capacity or capability, it's the grace of God that we are enjoying in this community. And he continues to endow us with more and more. 
the ICT Center, which is now in use, aims to train 60,000 students across board in the first five years on robotics, artificial intelligence, coding, among others. We want to bring all the students that have some potentials in them and how to transform that potential into the ICT solutions to address the immediate community and environment challenges. Again, a lot of things with respect to the aspect of our uh, digitalizing our society, taking off as a case study, offers a, a community that is under development and I've been able to understand that we can actually take this community into a Silicon Valley in Africa. The people say they are open to collaborations from governments at all levels to ensure that the hub functions to its fullest capacity to solidify the future of the youth. That's all from the nation's capital. Next is business news with Teniola Shobawali. Thanks a lot, Terry. Welcome to Business News. Nigeria's crude oil production capacity has reportedly dropped to its lowest level this year as it fell to 1.23 million barrels per day in August from an average 1.36 million barrels per day recorded in January. According to the 2021 crude oil and condensate production report released by the Department of Petroleum Resources, the output for last month also dropped by 6.7% on a month-on-month -month basis from 1.64 million barrels per day in July. The decline is largely credited to difficulties faced by some oil terminals, as well as the force majeure declared last month by Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria on Forcado's crude oil. Meanwhile, oil prices on the international market made some rebound today amid supply concerns as U.S. crude inventories have dropped to their lowest since September 2019 in hopes of improvement in trade relations between the U.S. and China. International oil price benchmark Brent crude jumped by about 2% to $72.73 per barrel as at 10.40 p.m. local time, while U.S. WTI crude was higher by 2.32% at $69.72 per barrel. Now, losses posted by some major blue chip stocks on the NGX has pushed the market's main indicator to a new low today. For more details about today's trading at the Stock Exchange, let's join Layo Adigoke. Thanks a lot for joining us for the stock market report. The all share index of the Nigerian exchange finally fell below the 39,000 level following five days as sustained sell pressure on some high value as well as mid cap equities. Well, no doubt it has been a bearish week and the worst day for the stock market as the latest round of profit taken by investors chopped off more than 146 billion naira from the total value of listed equities while the market's main recorded a 0.71% drop which is its biggest decline since the start of the month. The impact was also felt by mostly the banking sector's key components such as UBA and GT Holding Company after they released that impressive half-year 2021 result on Thursday. Airtel also added to the downturn with a 4.67% drop on its share price, while Lando was the major factor for the decline on its sector's index. Stocks' performance on the price table remains negative, with 19 losers led by Linkage Assurance against 13 gainers led by Veritas Capital, while UBA was the major contributor to lower turnover of 154.55 5 million shares traded by investors. And that's the stock market report for Friday. I'm Layo Adegoki. This news tonight, it's back to Millicent for the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Tani. The UN Human Rights Organization says the Taliban's response to peaceful protests has been increasingly violent with authorities using live ammunition, batons and whips that have resulted in at least four deaths. 
Demonstrations have taken place across Afghanistan since the fall of Kabul on August 15, demanding respect for women's rights and greater freedoms. For more on the situation there, another international news here, Sam and Pusey with Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The United Nations has warned that the freezing of some $10 billion worth in Afghan assets to keep it out of Taliban hands would cause a severe economic downturn and could push millions into poverty and hunger. Kabul traders have said they were dismayed by the slow pace of business despite an improvement in the security situation weeks after the Taliban had swept to power. A report from the UNDP showed 97% of Afghans' population may sink below the poverty line unless the country's political and economic crises are addressed. U.S. President Joe Biden has announced sweeping new COVID-19 measures that require workers at large companies to be vaccinated or face weekly testing. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. He has announced that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees to ensure that their workforces are fully vaccinated or show a negative test at least once a week. The measures also include a vaccine mandate for millions of federal government workers and comes as cases in the country are surging. My message to unvaccinated Americans is this. What more is there to wait for? What more do you need to see? We've made vaccinations free, safe and convenient. The vaccine is FDA approval. Over 200 million Americans have gotten at least one shot. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin. The Russian energy giant Gazprom has declared it has finished the construction of the Nord Stream 2 gas subsea pipeline to Germany. The much-politicised pipeline will double Russia's gas exporting capacity to Europe via the Baltic Sea and will allow Moscow to bypass Ukraine as a major route for its lucrative gas exports to Europe. Russia and Belarus have been holding vast joint military drills in both countries. Footage shows jets in the air, various tanks driving, charging and firing, as well as ships firing. The military exercise has prompted condemnation in the NATO military alliance and European Union countries. Russia and Belarus are formerly part of a union state and have been in talks for years to further integrate their nations. Footage has been released showing Hurricane Olaf's winds and rain in the southern tip of Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. The video was taken in the resort of Cabo San Lucas and shows strong winds and waves on the beach as well as rains battering the streets. Olaf is forecast to continue moving toward the northwest on Friday and weaken over the weekend as it moves over land. Chinese President Xi Jinping has spoken with his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden on the phone for the first time in seven months. A White House statement said both leaders had discussed the responsibility of both nations to ensure competition does not veer into conflict. This is only the second call between them since President Biden took office. U.S.-China relations have been tense with clashes over issues like trade, espionage and the pandemic. A video that appears to show U.S. soldiers driving among crowds of people in the Guinean capital Conakry has been fueling speculation that America had some involvement in this week's coup. The video shows people yelling and greeting American soldiers who are smiling back and have assured they have not been involved in it. U.S. service members were doing a joint training exercise outside Guinea and had to go back to the U.S. embassy in Conakry. Japan's popular coronavirus vaccination minister Taro Kono has officially announced his candidacy to lead the ruling party and therefore become the next prime minister. Kono becomes the third candidate to throw his hat into the ring for the leadership of the Liberal Democratic Party, which opened up last week when Prime Minister Yoshide Suga said he would step down. Kono taro de Speaking at a news conference in Tokyo, Kono portrayed himself as a reformer, taking on red tape and bureaucracy. And finally, a zoo in Sydney has welcomed two baby bilbies, which are endangered animals. 
Bilbies are believed to have inhabited Australia for up to 15 million years and were once found across 70% of Australia's landmass, according to Bush Heritage Australia. Zookeepers hope to use them as part of a breeding program or to release them back into the wild. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. South Africa's women's national team, Bayana Bayana, are intensifying preparations in the bubble at the Safa Technical Center for the Aisha Buhari Cup. Head coach Desiree Ellis says the team is committed to improved performances, not just for the Invitational, but also for their upcoming tournaments. Um, yes, our players look reasonably fit, but uh, it will only be tested, um, you know, at the Buhari Cup, and that's what we want. You know, we've asked um, the, the association to get, um, you know, uh, top quality friendlies. We played the likes of um, Zambia and Botswana, and we couldn't have asked for better after the cancellation of the Netherlands match. I mean, you got uh, four of the top five there, and then you have Morocco. So, and now that the fixtures are changed, we have two big quality games, you know, against Ghana and against Nigeria. So, I think the players already are up for it. You don't need no motivation when you play those top countries. And Portugal's superstar Cristiano Ronaldo will make his first Manchester United appearance since his blockbuster move from the old lady of Turin Juventus when Newcastle visit Old Trafford come Saturday. Ronaldo returned to United in a shock transfer just before the transfer deadline. The 36-year-old striker who left United to join Real Madrid in 2009 has been training with his new teammates for the past few days. And that's a wrap on Sports News. Is back to you, Millicent, for the round. Today. And the main news again. The Court of Appeal in Abuja today has mandated status quo ante with respect to all matters concerning value added tax collection. Also today, President Muhammadu Buhari appealed to striking health workers to embrace negotiations as a means of ending strikes in the sector. And Vice President Professor Yemi Shibajo harped on the commitment of elites towards achieving greater responsibility for peace and development. He spoke at a leadership conference and awards organized by leadership newspapers owned by late Mr. Sam and Isaiah. And United Nations condemned Taliban crackdown on protesters, said response to protests increasingly violent. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antwonwoka. Have a good night and stay safe.